All right, hello and welcome to this evidence video capsule. And in this video capsule, I'm gonna get into some advanced issues concerning the residual exception to the hearsay rule. And in particular, the manner in which you are permitted or a court is permitted to use corroborating evidence to help confirm the reliability of a particular piece of hearsay. Now, if that sounds confusing to you, it's probably a good idea if you haven't done so to listen to some of my other capsules on hearsay, and in particular, the one that covers the residual exception to the hearsay rule. In this particular capsule, I'm going to focus on the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in 2017 called the Queen and Bradshaw. And I'm going to look at the manner in which I think that case has narrowed uh, the, the uh, party's ability to adduce corroborating evidence. And I'll look at some of the impacts of whether that's a good or a bad thing. So I'll be using this example um, through my discussion of how this particular case impacted on the hearsay rule. It's pretty straightforward. This is the accused, Johnny. This is the complainant, Bob. This is our witness who's testifying in court. That's an important distinction in any hearsay case. So Carl is the witness on the witness stand. And Lenny, let's just say, is dead to make it easier. Sorry, Lenny, but uh, dead always means that the witness is unavailable. So essentially, you have an out-of-court witness, that's Lenny, telling him some details about what Johnny purportedly did. It's being used against Johnny for the truth of its contents, and essentially it shows how Johnny started this particular flight fight, which is a key element of what the Crown is trying to prove in this case. Okay, Our witness is dead. There is no special exception to the hearsay rule that applies to this type of conversation. So the only way to admit this evidence is by showing it is reliable. Now those of you know uh, the hearsay exception, no, we also need to show that it's necessary, but he's dead, so it's necessary. That's the easiest way to satisfy the necessity principle. So we've got to show that this evidence is sufficiently reliable to be admitted. How do we do that? So reliability nowadays requires an assessment of two separate categories of factors. The Supreme Court has done quite a bit of job in past years in terms of classifying these factors a little bit differently than they used to. One is what they often refer to as circumstantial reliability, although they sometimes now call it substantive reliability. And the second is whether there are sufficient guarantees to admit the evidence, what they now call procedural reliability. And these are alternatives. They require you to look at two separate sets of factors. So if you want to boil down what these are actually all about, here's how I like to think about them. Circumstantial reliability asks, can we trust the evidence? Okay, Is it effectively reliable? Because we can look at it and say, this is good evidence. It doesn't look at whether or not we can evaluate the evidence properly. It's just, are there things to do with this evidence that allow us to trust it? So if you go back, for example, to some of our common law exceptions, which I'm hoping you're familiar with if you're watching this capsule, we might be talking about the res gestae exception for spontaneous declarations. Well, that exception is based on the idea that we can trust the evidence because it was made in a very spontaneous fashion before the witness has the time to think up a lie. So that's a circumstantial guarantor of trustworthiness. That is to be treated separately, according to the Supreme Court, from what we call procedural guarantees, which ask a different question. Can we evaluate? So whether or not we can evaluate the evidence is different from whether or not we can trust it. So we might not be able to we not, might not be able to trust the evidence at all. However, if the witness is there, able to be cross-examined, and the hearsay is an out-of-court statement made by that very witness, and the witness has a full memory, well, we may or may not be able to trust the evidence, but we're certainly able to evaluate it because the witness is available for cross-examination. So, circumstantial guarantors ask, can we trust it? Procedural guarantors say, can we evaluate it? And procedural guarantors include, the witness is available for cross-examination, the witness was video recorded, so we can actually see the witness as they were given the out-of-court statement. And there are lesser procedural guarantees as well. The nature of the questioning might have been like a cross-examination. Something along those lines are what we call procedural guarantees. Now, for the rest of this capsule, 
I'm not really that concerned about procedural guarantees. Because what we are asking, and the entirety of the Supreme Court decision, more or less, in Bradshaw, there's one little element that gets into procedural guarantees, but really, we're asking, well, what are circumstantial guarantees, and when can we look at what's called corroborating evidence to evaluate? So if we're looking at circumstantial guarantees, and again, I have another capsule that gets into this in detail, what we are actually looking at is things like, well, can we trust the witness? When was the statement made? Two, how was it made? In what circumstances? Three, who was it made to? Four, does the person have a motive? Etc. There's all sorts of them. Let's just say there are six or seven different things you can look at, all designed to say the same thing. Can we trust the witness? Okay? Now, I promise you, there are at least six or seven different indicators because the list isn't closed. You're effectively looking at all the things that might make you trust the evidence because you can't cross-examine on it. Remember, that is the bane of the hearsay rule. It's the reason why we have it. We're going to look at all these factors and say, are we comfortable admitting this evidence because we trust it? Right? We don't need to cross-examine on it because we trust it. So all of these factors look at that. And there's only one factor that does answer the question of whether or not we can trust it, but it seems clear that the Supreme Court wants to look at it differently. And the reason is, it doesn't look at all the circumstances that go into making the statement, who made it, how did they make it, when did they make it. Instead, it simply asks the larger question, can we trust the evidence because it is most likely true? Hmm, what do I mean by that? Let's go take a look. So Bradshaw is about this question of what we call corroborative evidence and when we're allowed to use corroborative evidence to uh, help guarantee the reliability of a hearsay statement. Now, if you think about it for just a moment, I just set out all the different types of circumstantial reliability that they are. And remember, the person who we're concerned about is not Carl. Carl is available in court to be cross-examined. The problem with hearsay is that Carl can only answer what he knows. And the person who really knows the details is Lenny. And Lenny's dead. So one of the ways we would traditionally look to the nature of uh, the reliability of Lenny's statement is, as I just told you, well, what do we know about Lenny? Did he have a motive to fabricate against Johnny? Is he just some innocent bystander? When did he make the statement? Did he make it five minutes after it occurred or three hours later when he had lots of time to fabricate about it? Um, what, are, what are things we know about the statement? Is the statement detailed? Does it provide a comprehensive overview? Does it give us some detail about where Lenny was standing and what Lenny saw and what Lenny heard? The more detail we have, the more reason we have to trust Lenny, etc., etc., etc. Now, here is a different type of factor. Look at this part of the statement here. He said he remembered what Johnny said because it was the same thing his dad once said. I did not include what Johnny said, but let's say it's a very particular type of curse. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's a curse of some sort. That's a very, very particular, specific curse. And the curse is essentially A plus B plus C. A very rare combination of words or something along those lines. Why does Lenny remember exactly what Johnny said? Because his dad once said it. Well, what if we could get what his dad once said? Maybe his dad wrote it down, or maybe his dad's willing to testify, or whatever. And his dad said, yeah, I once had a big fight with some guy, and I called him an A plus B plus C. Does that help us evaluate the trustworthiness of what Lenny said? Well, the argument is, yes, it does. Why? Because now we have a piece of corroborating evidence. Assuming we can show that Lenny's dad had no connection to this whatsoever, Lenny's dad's just provided a compelling piece of evidence. He's able to say... Lenny's account is more likely to be true because I said something just like that, which is exactly what Lenny said in this particular occasion, uh, Johnny is alleged to have said. So essentially what we have is some sort of corroborating evidence. And let me just say there are other pieces of corroborating evidence too. If Lenny's an innocent bystander, he said Johnny drove up in a red car. Well, what if we can prove that on the night in question, Johnny was driving a red car? These are, this is called corroborative evidence, and let's just say that the law uses corroboration all the time. It's a standard part of uh, criminal law, civil law, every law, really. Evidence law essentially looks to pieces of a puzzle to decide whether a particular event is more likely. If Lenny says that Johnny drove up in a red car, and we can prove that Johnny had a red car, well, that makes it more likely that what Lenny's telling us is true. Certainly, it's more likely than if Lenny, Johnny had a blue car. Right? We would not have corroborating evidence. In fact, that corroborating evidence would make Lenny's account less likely, and hence, less reliable. So, 
question for the law of evidence is, how do we deal with corroborating evidence in deciding upon the reliability of a particular piece of hearsay? Well, the law of evidence has not always been consistent, and I'm going to give you the major highlights. For many years, the question was open. And then along came the Supreme Court in a case called Starr in 2000. You know what they said? No, you cannot use corroborating evidence. They wanted to very clearly focus the circumstantial reliability inquiry upon the circumstances of making the statement. So what do we know about the statement maker? What do we know about the circumstances in which the statement was made in? They felt that opening up the inquiry more broadly would end up having a what's called a bootstrapping effect in which you would use the strength of the case to strengthen the reliability of the hearsay. And they didn't like it. So they said, no bootstrapping. You're not allowed to use this evidence to bolster the reliability of the statement. That didn't last long. In 2005, the Supreme Court revisited the question in a case called Kellowan. And in 2005, the Supreme Court essentially overruled itself and said, yes, corroborative evidence is useful. It essentially allows us to be certain that the evidence being given by the hearsay declarant is reliable, so you can use it. And let me just say the quintessential hearsay corroboration case, which, you know, I think Kellowan was right, mainly because the Supreme Court had done this as early as 1990. Very famous case, one of the first cases under the hearsay revolution called Khan. And in Khan, you had a little girl. And this little girl made a statement to her mother. And in the statement to her mother, it said, I've been sexually assaulted. And you want to know what the corroborating evidence was? They found semen on her clothing. That's pretty darn good corroborative evidence. Because the girl, unfortunately, was too young to actually testify. She couldn't give any evidence in court. But what she could say is, here's what the doctor did to me, hearsay. And with all that semen on her shirt, she had pretty strong corroborating physical evidence. Didn't matter how reliable she was, really. Uh, she was a young girl. She might have been mistaken. She might have said she was being sexually assaulted. She didn't know what was going on. I don't know. We could make up excuses all day. But with the semen on her clothing, it's pretty darn good corroborative evidence. You need the hearsay to actually explain what happened. It's not enough to just have the semen, although it's pretty close to being good enough in this day and age. But nonetheless, um, it's, 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 it helps admit the hearsay because it makes the hearsay more reliable. So the Supreme Court in Kellowan took a backpedal and said, no, we're going to allow this evidence to be admitted. It's useful. It allows us to assess whether this evidence is truthful. And that is where we were right up to 2017. This lasted 12 years when the Supreme Court heard the case of Bradshaw. So you can look at Bradshaw in many different ways. I like to think that Bradshaw is a good example of hard cases make bad law. It's essentially a pretty crappy hearsay statement in a situation of a really a Mr. Big investigation where you're trying to get two co-accused and get one co-accused, A, to rat out B as well as himself. And unfortunately, he gives a whack of different statements. He implicates himself. He implicates the other guy. He does all sorts of things that make his reliability very, very suspect. So you have this guy because when it comes to the trial, A refuses to testify. So now you have to admit his hearsay if you're ever going to have a chance of getting B, Bradshaw. And unfortunately, you don't have a lot. So what the Crown tries to do is bring in all their corroborating evidence. Okay? Most people who've looked at this case tend to think that this was a pretty crappy statement given all the, the problems that it had, especially if you couldn't cross-examine the witness. Um, so at the end of the day, you don't have a great statement. But the Supreme Court took the occasion to say, we don't like this use of corroborating evidence as a way of trying to bolster statements, and we're going to restrict it as much as possible. So first, they made what I think is a relatively uncontroversial statement. Any corroborative evidence must go to the reliability of the statement. And I think that's certainly true. What I mean by that is, sometimes what you can have is a piece of evidence, this hearsay statement, that's just the final piece of a really good conviction puzzle. So you have hearsay evidence plus A plus B plus C plus D plus E. And you know what you think to yourself? Boy, A plus B plus C plus D plus E are really strong against the accused, Mr. Bradshaw. So that's a really strong corroborating case. But the problem is that none of this evidence individually actually corroborates any details of the statement. It doesn't actually affect the statement itself. The statement is just the last piece of a puzzle against the witness. And the court said that's not fair. Corroborating evidence is not designed to make the case look strong. It has to be designed to make the hearsay look strong. 
So the first thing they did, which is to me the only uncontroversial part of what they did, is they said any corroborative evidence has to go to details in the statement. So if you remember, I showed you how that worked. If he talks about a red car, you got to prove he had a red car. He says his father said the same thing, you got to prove his father said the same thing. That's corroborative. It's not enough to say we've got this really good hearsay statement and all this other good evidence that bolsters the case. Not enough. It's the next parts that get controversial and I'll tell you why. First of all, they started to create what I call a threshold test. Number one is two elements. For corroborative evidence to be admitted, it has to go to material aspects of the hearsay statement. And second of all, the corroborating evidence on its own has to show that the only likely explanation for the hearsay statement is the, declarative, is the declarant's truthfulness. And that is uh, a really significant change to the hearsay rule. And I'll show you why. Essentially, the Supreme Court changed the formula. This is as simple as I can make it look for you. Kellowan is the pre-Bradshaw decision that ruled previously, and Bradshaw is what happened. So if you look at Kellowan, with Kellowan, corroborating evidence was just one factor out of all the different factors that measured reliability. So essentially what you did was, was you said, well, we got, you know, good circumstances in which it's made, it was made spontaneously, the person had no motive to lie, and there was some corroborating evidence. No more. Bradshaw sets up a threshold test, and it effectively says you can only admit corroborating evidence if it's effectively overwhelming. Corroborative evidence has to be, essentially show that the evidence is so truthful. Think about Khan, for example, because they endorsed Khan. The corroborating evidence of the semen on the shirt was so powerful in and of itself that you virtually didn't need to look to the other criteria. So essentially what they've done is they've made it a lot harder to get corroborating evidence in. Instead of being just one factor to be considered, it's now a primary factor that has to be considered in isolation before it can be admitted. Why'd they do this, you ask? I can only think of two reasons. One, they're very skeptical of the idea that corroborating evidence should be used. They prefer to look at whether or not the person could be cross-examined, which looks at the features that person has. So for example, in Bradshaw, this was a terrible witness. The witness who made the statement had motives to lie, was a terrible person, was really a bad witness, and frankly, the type of person you'd want to cross-examine. So to, to let corroborating evidence in in that situation as a way of guaranteeing reliability means, according to the court, that you have to negate this witness. You have to negate this witness's deficiencies before they would allow it to happen. Second reason seems to be a time concern. They're worried that corroborating evidence effectively becomes a way of litigating the whole trial simply to decide whether a piece of hearsay should be admitted. I'm really not convinced by either of these rationales, and I'll explain why going forward, but that seems to have been what motivated the court in this circumstance. So, what are my concerns? Well, I never like threshold tests to a threshold test. I think it's a terrible idea to say, well, we're not going to allow corroborative evidence in unless it satisfies its own threshold. Because thankly, frankly, I don't think hearsay works that way. It's more likely that you will have pieces of reliability that can be bolstered by corroborative evidence. And I think it's very rare that corroborative evidence is going to be the overwhelming piece of the puzzle that admits the hearsay in the first place. And frankly, I don't think it's wise to do it that way. I'm not convinced that these concerns about bolstering or time, the time concern has never been proven to me that we're suddenly wasting so much time on these uh, uh, reliability inquiries that we suddenly have to stop doing them altogether to save time. Um, I, I just don't see that. I think what's much more likely is you have pieces of a plus B plus C, and you also have some corroborating evidence. And frankly, as an aside, I don't even like the way the court has tried to split off the two inquiries to begin with. If you remember back to the beginning, they had circumstantial reliability, and they had procedural reliability. Well, I think, in truth, these work a lot more in tandem than the court believes. I think when there is a big difference, in my mind, between a statement that is video recorded, or a person who can be cross-examined, even partially, over a person who can't. But the court has segmented these inquiries and said we've got to deal with them separately. Anytime they segment inquiries, I think they're a lot less likely to get to the overwhelming question, which is, is this evidence good enough to be admitted? And I think every time they segment it off, they make it harder and harder to reach an answer or a good answer to that question. So I do not like separate inquiries. I think it's a poor way of dealing with this problem.
More so than in every other case, the court started using language like the only explanation. The idea that hearsay is so troublesome that we should only let it in where cross-examination would not help. Court said that many times. That's why they said the corroborating evidence has to be so overwhelming that the only explanation is that the evidence is true. Frankly, I'm not thrilled with this either. I think it's a nice idea in theory to say that hearsay should not be admitted if cro unless cross-examination would not help at all. But frankly, I think it's absolutely divorced from reality. Um, I actually think the reality is that most hearsay would never get anywhere near a courtroom if you had to show the cross-examination would not help. The truth of the matter is, cross-examination often helps. We live in an imperfect world. The whole reason to having exceptions to the hearsay rule is that sometimes we can't have the original evidence present. So the idea that you're going to set this crazy high threshold that says the only explanation is that cross-examination would not help and the evidence is true, nice idea in theory, poor idea in execution. What I think we should be looking is, at the very least, that the hearsay is reliable, worth being admitted in the circumstances. And if you want to talk about this idea of explanations, I'd at least go with most likely explanation rather than the only explanation, because I just think that's a terrible way of looking at it. And again, I think it, let's not forget that the residual exception to the hearsay rule is not the only exception to the hearsay rule. And we have all these common law exceptions that are supposed to be based on the principle of reliability and necessity. And if your version of reliability, according to the Supreme Court, is that it guarantees that the only explanation for the hearsay is true, well, in my opinion, you'd lose most of your hearsay under the common law exceptions. The idea that a spontaneous utterance automatically produces the only explanation being truth garbage. The idea that a business record, because it's produced in the course of business, means that the only explanation is truth? Ridiculous. None of these exceptions would stand up if we started applying this type of rigorous analysis. So my question is, why apply this level of rigor and analysis only for corroborating evidence in the residual exception? It simply makes no sense to me, and frankly, I think it's a bad idea. And frankly, I don't even think the court's internal analysis is compelling. They say only material aspects that are corroborating should be allowed to be admitted for the reliability analysis. And I just don't think that makes any sense. You can have a lot of details in a statement. Let's say a statement is incredibly detailed. It could be 50 pages long. If you can corroborate 20 smaller elements, I think that's important to showing that the evidence is reliable. And the court used the example of someone who has a motive to lie. Well, if someone has a motive to lie, they might get 18 parts of the statement correct, but the most important material part's wrong, so you've got to corroborate the material elements. Okay, I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's not the only reason we're concerned about hearsay. What about a witness, a hearsay witness, who has no motive to lie? We accept that, no motive to lie, but we are concerned about their memory or their perception. Well, are you trying to tell me that if you can corroborate 50 minor elements of their statement, that that does not go to show that their memory and perception are good? I think it does, and I think the court, once again, threw the baby out with the bathwater, trying to make a specific point, reaching way too far. So what's the impact of this case? Guess what? Less corroborating evidence, and down the road, less admissible hearsay. I guess how you feel about that depends upon how you feel about admitting hearsay uh, in, in court. Number two, segmented analysis, less flexibility. I mean, it used to be you would look at all the factors together and try and build something up. Now the court has built up all sorts of segments. They've said corroborating evidence goes over here. You've got to get through that door before you can even get to the reliability, the substantive reliability or circumstantial reliability. And that is, of course, divided from the procedural reliability. And frankly, I just think that's way too messy. I think there are a lot of factors that go into deciding whether the hearsay say is sufficiently reliable to be admitted, the more we segment it up, the more we set up the possibility for legal error and make it more difficult for courts to actually decide on whether the hearsay is good enough to go in. And I guess ultimately, that's the real impact. The residual exception has just become less effective in light of Bradshaw, which I would say is the most significant part of this case. For 25 years, at least, we've been going down a road that says, let's admit more hearsay. This is the first sign of the court pumping the brakes, saying, nah, maybe we shouldn't admit this much hearsay. And that's what I think is the hidden message underlying this decision. Hearsay is problematic. Sums up my thoughts on the Bradshaw decision. It's a big one. Hope that was useful to you. Have a great day.
To learn more about this topic, you might want to check out my book, The Law of Witnesses and Evidence in Canada, published by Thomson Reuters. This book covers every topic involving the law of evidence and also how witnesses come before courts and tribunals in criminal, civil, and administrative proceedings. To learn more, you can check out my website at petersankoff.com.